长长。I would like to I would like to wish everyone a happy Sabbath. Ah, oh, wonderful. Today is a beautiful day. If we get rain, it's a beautiful day. If it's not raining, it's still a beautiful day because we are here in God's house on his holy day. Amen. And I am so happy to be here. You know, it was so nice this morning when we came in for Sabbath school and there were so many people here. Almost all of them were sitting at the desks here. And I thought to myself, yes, the Lord is good. He gives us an opportunity to respond to his invitations. And those invitations are always free. And we demonstrate what we find valuable by what we do. Because we do what we think is important. And I thought to myself, maybe I should speak to the Sabbath school leader 
and tell her, maybe we should start charging admission. <laughs> but anyway, we have a few announcements today. And uh, let's see, Pastor Govea is on vacation through the 31st of this month. So if you have any issues that you need to speak to a pastor about, contact Pastor Miranda or our elder Melvin Blue. Alrighty, we have first readings for a transfer. Our sister Noreen Vogue is, has left Fresno and she's in Sacramento now. So this is gonna be the first reading of transfer membership from Fresno Central to the Carmichael SDA Church in Sacramento. And we'll vote on this next week. We had some nominations uh, for some positions. This is gonna be the first reading and we will vote on these next Sabbath. Uh, Isaias Barrios as a deacon, and Giovanni Ventura also for a deacon, uh, Maricela Barban as a deaconess from the Spanish group, and um, Pete Nicholas and Pam Medalla are going to be uh, joining the plant committee. So we'll be voting on that next Sabbath. Now let's see. We have donations today for the Liberty Magazine. Uh, they're due today from what I understand. So place your offering in the tithe envelope and market Liberty. And make your check out to the Fresno Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. Don't worry, we won't keep the money. We'll send it to the Liberty people. <clears throat> we have a few events today that I wanna bring to your attention. Um, Area 7 training seminar from 2.30 to 3.45 uh, there's going to be great controversy dis distribution, and the training seminar begins at 4 to 5.30, and it's going to be at the Fresno Hispanic SDA Church on Olive Avenue. So if you want something interesting to do this afternoon, check that out. It's, uh, it's in your bulletin, so if you forget what I said, it's there. Um, let's see. Needs. The Church of Tomorrow, uh, they're in the Cradle Roll class today. Um, the folks in Cradle Roll and Kindergarten need piano players. So if you would like to enhance the worship experience for our little ones, and you can play the piano, even if you're not great, if you can play the piano, you can help them when they sing the songs. And frankly, listening to the little children sing is a wonderful thing. So if you, if the spirit is moving you to do that, there's a sign up sheet back in the foyer and bless them and I guarantee you will be blessed as well. Uh, let's see, uh, some more events coming up. Okay, this is today. We're welcoming Secrets Unsealed in the anchor class. You can see, uh, the anchor class is finishing up today, and I'm sure everyone who's been involved has been blessed. And praise the Lord. When we, when we delve into the Word of God, it is a rich experience, and I'm sure I don't need to tell you folks that because you know it from experience for this week. So praise the Lord. Um, and because this is such a special day, we're having potluck next door as soon as church is over. We can all eat together and fellowship as brothers and sisters in Christ. 2 p.m., there is gonna be an English class taught, taught by Kelly Miranda in the junior room that's back there. And uh, 2.30 to 3.45, that's where we just talked about the Area 7, uh, great controversy distribution. 3 to 4.30, the Spanish group is going to be doing outreach and visitation. 4 to 5.30 p.m. training seminars at the Fresno Hispanic SDA Church. We just mentioned that again. Uh, 6 o'clock to 9 p.m. youth and young adults game night in the fellowship hall. So if you want to have an enjoyable time afterwards, come to game night, 6 o'clock, starting this afternoon. Uh, let's see. Wednesday, March 27th, 5 to 8 p.m., Women's Ministry Fellowship Dinner in the Novielli's home. Wow, that sounds like it'll be real nice. Uh, Sabbath, March 10th, next week, Communion Sabbath. So please, make sure you put that on your calendar. Be here for Communion, because Communion is always a blessing. Always a blessing. 
March 30, uh, next week, Vespers program, 4.30. We're going to be continuing with the uh, viewing of the days of Noah. So guaranteed, you're gonna find it fascinating, interesting. So if you can be here next Sabbath afternoon, make it your business to be here. 4.30. And the reason why it's 4.30 is because right after Saturday night, March 30th, 7 p.m., there's going to be a movie presentation, Do You Believe? So it sounds like a movie of faith. So we will see. That's next Sabbath. We want to pray for healing. Carl Franquito, who's ill today, uh, Pastor Miranda for healing, Pastor Alvin Mirage, and Anil Kanda. Keep these men in your prayers. Uh, Olivia Sanchez's mother passed away. We want to keep her in prayer as well. What's that? Olivia, uh, Olivia Sanchez's mother. Yeah. Um, Mary Quenza was on a hike and she fell off the pathway and I think she went into a river or something seriously bad. She's missing for about a week. So let's keep her in prayer as well. Uh, let's see. And I think, I think that's all of our announcements. So we will begin our worship service very shortly. As we, as we prepare for prayer, for those of you that are able, if you would please kneel and we will sing hymn number 692, The Lord is in His Holy Temple. 692. The Lord is in His Holy Temple. Our Father and our God, we come before you today on this, your holy Sabbath day, the time that you've set apart, especially for us to worship you. And as we look up to you today, we pray that you would send your spirit to be in each heart. Bless us with your presence. We know that as we cooperate with you, you will bless us and develop us into the people that you would have us to be. And we thank you so much for the wonderful plan of salvation that takes us from sin and degradation and turns us into saints. So I pray that you would continue that process with us and we wanna praise you today for your mighty power in our behalf. We ask that you would be with our loved ones, our friends, our family, those that are sick, those that are dealing with grief, separation of loved ones by death. We ask that you would be close to each one May each one know that you are there for them and that you see every single detail of their, of, your, of their life and that nothing escapes your notice. We know that you're a loving father because that's what you've told us in your word and we trust you to do all things well. We ask now that you would be with our pastor, Pastor Bohr, as he brings the message to us. May we hear your voice speaking to us through him. We ask all this in Jesus' name, amen.
Our opening song will be hymn number 620 on Jordan's Stormy Banks. That's hymn number 620 on Jordan's Stormy Banks. We'll sing all four verses. And if you will please stand, we will go ahead and sing. Doesn't that fill your heart with joy? You may be seated. At this time, we'll be collecting our offering for today. And uh, the loose offering is going to be going to the conference Faith Advance. Our conference exists for one real reason, and that is to spread the news that Jesus coming is very close at hand. And the wonderful thing about today's offering is as we contribute, we are sharing in that uh, mission of giving this news to the world. To let them know Jesus is coming soon and it's time to make sure that we are getting ready, that it is a, a priority in our lives. So, we can get ready ourselves, and we can, we can help others get ready as well. And wouldn't that be wonderful to see folks in, in heaven that are there because of our help and our assistance in this work? 
So let's, uh, let's bow our heads. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this wonderful privilege that we can have, that we can not only bless others with hearing about the good news that your coming is soon, but also that you will bless us as we are faithful to you. We ask that uh, we would see how faithful you are as we are faithful to you. Bless us according to your love, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I have it from a reliable source that if anyone wants to participate in the anchor class after lunch, that they are free to do so. This is, this is I have to say, this is a deal. <laughs> the only caveat is, for those of you who want to, you have to sit in the pews, because the seats here in the front are already taken. I think I know where I'm going to be this afternoon. OK, uh, right now we have a ch our children's story. Dr. Tree is going to present a children's story to us. And uh, I'm sure you're all going to enjoy it. So all the children are invited to come down to the front and uh, listen to Dr. Tree. Come on down. Happy Sabbath, everyone. How are you guys doing today? Good, very good. OK. I have a very, very special story for you today. OK, the title of the story is Challenges and Obstacle, OK? So how many of you have had obstacle or challenges? Your parents, your mom or dad have given you some hard, difficult, very, very difficult tasks. And what are they? What have your mom or dad asked you to do? Math. OK. 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 
did, did, did you have that challenges too? Are you sure? Why, why, why can't I memorize or why can't I remember the multiplication with 2, 4, 6, 8 versus 2 times 1 is 2, 2 times 2 is 4. Why can't I, why can't I just memorize it the other way? Why do I have to go 2 times 1 is 2? Right? That's the challenges. Yes? To sleep on time so your parents can go to sleep. <laughs> yes, sir. Doing a race response and reading. Okay, okay. So reading was one, and what was the other one? Okay, well, I'm going to help you overcome those challenges with this story, okay? There are ways you can overcome challenges and obstacles. Caitlin and I, my oldest daughter, she's right here, she loves to cook, and we had helped her to, uh, we asked her to help us with a vegetable dish. She cooks a wonderful, wonderful vegetable dish, and I was cooking a dish that we needed, um, we needed some, what is this? What is it? Garlic. Garlic, right? So she loves to put garlic in her vegetable, right, Kay? Yeah. Correct Ba if Ba have any mistake, okay? Ba don't remember the exact detail, okay? So she came running out. She grabbed her garlic, and she stepped on her stool. And then I was sitting there, and I'm like, I don't hear anything. And all of a sudden, she's like, why did you chop the onion? Right? So there was, a, there was, it wasn't a whole onion. It was like a sliver of onion on the chopping board. I'm like, I was shocked. I'm like, why is she asking me why did I chop onion? So I was like, and then a few minutes later, she just stands there. Were you peeling yet or not yet? Not yet. She wasn't peeling. She wasn't moving. I asked Caitlin. I said, what's wrong? It's burning my eyes. I was like, oh, was that a challenge? Mm -hmm. well, was that a challenge? Yes. Okay, so her challenge was the onion was burning her eyes. Agree? Right? What was her obstacle? The obstacle was the onion was sitting on the chopping board. Right? And what did she do? She says, why did you chop the onion? I told her, I said, because Ba's going to use it to flavor the fried rice. That's what I told her. So as human, the first thing when we get into challenges and obstacles, what do we do? We complain. Right? Did you complain or did you not complain? Oh, thank you. She's nodding her head. Okay. We complain. But instead of complaining, what should we do when we get into our first challenges or any challenges and any obstacle? What should we do? Just deal with it. No, I'll just. <laughs> you speak like an adult. Just deal with it. There's a better way, though. There is a better way. There's a better way. Ask questions and figure out the answers to those questions and build up the solutions. You're like a philosopher. You're too complex. <laughs> We're telling a children's story. We can't <laughs> keep it simple. Think about it. What do you do when you face a challenge in your life? We're all here in church. We do this every day. Come on, guys. You guys are smart. I know you know this. Even the young one, tell me, what do you do? Let me give you a hint. Pray. Say it loud. Pray. You pray. That's the first thing. Remember, when it comes to challenges and obstacles, please pray. It is so important to pray. So tonight, I want you to go home. Repeat after me. I want you to tell your mom and dad this. I promise not to complain. Say it loud. But rather pray. 
Okay, remember that. Okay, you're welcome, parents. Okay, <laughs> got it? Okay, first one. Okay, so what's the first way to overcome challenges and obstacles? Deal with it. No, 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 no. <laughs> and also read your Bible. Pray and read your Bible. Okay, so after that, I, I, I finally realized what her challenges and obstacle was. So then I said, Kaylin, please chop the, or peel the garlic and chop the garlic for boss so we can finish our dish, so we can have dinner. I wanted her to bear that. And there's a reason. Bob will tell you in a few minutes, okay? There's a reason why Bob wanted to, you to do that, okay? And so a few minutes later, she stepped down from her stool. She goes over the other side, the refrigerator side, and I'm waiting for her. She's just standing there, holding her eyes like this. She's like, it hurts. And she's on the other side. She's like, the, 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 the onion was here, and she's on the other side of the, of the island. She's like, it hurts. I was like, mm. You know, Jesus, our Father, wants to help us so much. But yet, when we are told to do something, what do we do? We walk the other way. When Ba sat there, Ba wanted it so bad to go in there and help you. But in order for Jesus to be able to help you, in order for Ba to go in there and help you, you have to obey. It is so important that you have to obey. Because Ba cannot help you until you say, yes, please help me. Agree? So what's the second way? First way was what? Pray. Pray. Second way is? Read the Bible. Read the Bible, okay. That's, that's, that's the first way, A. Second way is O. Oh. Deal with it. No. <laughs> You're going to join that group very soon. Obey. Obey, okay. So obey your father and your mother. Obey God, right? So then finally, I got her to obey, and she went over back to the... Uh, I, the other side of the island, and then she stepped on her stool, grudgingly, she's like, <sighs> and then she starts peeling the garlic, and then I, I, I gave her a suggestion. I said, Caitlin, if that onion is in your way, you can remove it. Find a way to take it away. Or you can stand there and peel and chop the garlic really fast, and get it done. Did Ba not say that? Okay? So I gave her options. So Jesus and God always give us options, right? And then so she ended up taking a bowl from the cabinet, the smallest one she could find, on the biggest chopping board, and she decided to start scooping the onion or the onion into a small bowl i looked over i said oh she's doing something but get a bigger bowl caitlin get a bigger bowl did Ba not tell you that right Ba said no she's grinning what did Ba say help Ba, you're grinning do you remember what happened no so so i i stood up i helped her and i i helped her use that small bowl and as we were scooping what happened when we were scooping into that small bowl? What fell on the ground? The onion. The onion, right? So when we, instead of listening to our father, we do things our way. And what happened? We make a bigger mess, and it slows things down, right? Correct? So then Ba went and took a bigger bowl, and what did Ba do? Hold your hand and scoop the onion into a bigger bowl. Was it faster? Yes. Thank you. Was it easier? Yes. 
Thank you. <laughs> agree or not agree? Yep. Okay. So first is to pray. Second is to obey. Third. Third. Do you know the reason why Bob did that? Part of it. Teach. What, why do you think Bob did that? Teach. Mm. Mm. Let Bob tell you. The reason why Bob did that is that Bob wants you to build strength. Bob wants you to have that ability to do things on your own. Right? Our Father is the same. We, our Father gives us these challenges to, so that way we can build our character, right? Bob wants to teach you perseverance, right? Your parents want to teach you perseverance. Do you know what that word is? <laughs> okay, perseverance is when you push through something no matter how hard it is and you finish it. No matter how long it takes, no matter how hard it is, and you push through it. Does that make sense? Right? So after that incident, we finished, we finished the, um, the dish, and it was wonderful. It was lovely. The family loved it. Ba searched for answer in the Bible, and this is what Ba came up with. So the verse here is found in Proverbs 16, 9. It says, a man's heart plan his way, but the Lord direct his step. So when we plan the way that we do things, whether you do it, you know, with a small bowl or a big bowl, our Father will always be with us, no matter how we plan our trip, no matter what challenges we face, our Father is always there for us. Okay? So that's one. Okay? The other verse. Is found in Roman. Let's see. Where is it? Roman 5. I'll remember it. Maybe Pastor Boyd can help us. I think it's Romans 5, 4. Tribulation built endurance. Endurance built characters. And character built hope. It's not exact word for word. But is that, does that make sense to you guys? No. Okay, good. I'm glad you said no. I want to wrap it up real quick, real simple for you guys. We go through trial and test in our life to build our, to make us stronger. And when we become stronger, we become Christ-like. And when we become Christ-like, we can one day see him and have hope to be in heaven with him. Okay? So remember, all right, would anyone like to pray? Anyone? No. Okay. Well, I was going to pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for the children. Please help us to remember to continue to pray, to continue to be obedient, and help these children to be able to persist and strengthen them and be more like you each and every day. In your precious name I pray. Amen. Scripture reading this morning is found in Daniel 2, chapters, um, verses 20 and 21. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, 
For wisdom and might are his, and he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding.
Good morning. Let's try that again with the microphone. Good morning. So nice to see all the anchor students here all dressed up. You look really nice. I want to take this opportunity to thank the Fresno Central Church for being willing to allow us to have the Anchor School of Theology here in the church this year. The last couple of years we've done it in other cities of the United States, but um, this year we decided that we would do it here, and when I contacted Pastor Govea, he said I don't think that there would be any problem having it here in the church. I know it's a little inconvenience for the members of the church, because uh, I know that you have your regular seats that you stake a claim to. <clears throat> but it's only one Sabbath uh, in the whole year. So next Sabbath, you will be able to stake your claim once more. Uh, we have this year close to 60 students in our Anchor School of Theology. We have them from all over the world. We have some from Australia, we have a gentleman from Ireland, and we have people from many states in the United States as well. Many different uh, careers, many different languages, many different places that everyone is from. We've really enjoyed this week, haven't we? Amen. That was weak. <laughs> We've really enjoyed this week, haven't we? All right, praise the Lord. Uh, it's been very intense. Uh, some days we've had up to five sessions in the day. We've ended at six o'clock in the afternoon. It's easy to get burned out when you have five sessions studying the book of Daniel, which is a very complex book. Uh, but uh, we've uh, worked our way through it. Today is number 24 since last Monday. 24 hours so far, and this afternoon we have two more. Uh, at 2.30 in the afternoon, uh, we have a session where we're going to study some aspects relating to Daniel 11, and then uh, we have a Q&A from 3.30 uh, to 4, and then at 4 o'clock we have our final presentation. And uh, we would be glad to have any church member that would want to attend uh, to come to the last two sessions this afternoon. So once again, Pastor Govea isn't here, but every time that I've asked him for a favor, he said yes. He's a delight to work with, as is Pastor Miranda. This church is greatly blessed by the pastoral staff that we have here. As the former pastor of the church, I'm very proud to be a member of Fresno Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I expect to be until Jesus comes or till death do us part, <laughs> which I expect to be number one, not number two. All right, I want to let the crew know that I am going to start now. They told me to let, let them know when I'm going to start. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we come before your throne, your awesome throne, and we come in the powerful name of Jesus. Because we know that when we pray in the name of Jesus, you incline your ear, not only to hear, but also to answer. We ask, Lord, that you will be with us as we open your word today. That your Holy Spirit might hover over this place, open our minds to understand, open our hearts to receive, and empower us, Lord, to share this wonderful message that you have given to our church. We thank you for the promise of your presence, and we claim that promise in the precious and most holy name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> I would like to begin our study today by inviting you to go with me to Daniel chapter 2 and verses 20 and 21. For those who have the study notes, we are going to study the chapter on the historical chapters of Daniel. I'm not going to follow it slavishly. I've done some adjustments, some additions, and some subtractions, so probably it would be easier just to pay attention 
to what I'm saying rather than trying to find the information in the study notes. Daniel 2, 20 and 21 was our scripture reading for today. And these verses contain the central theme of the entire book of Daniel. And this is how it reads. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And now three things that I want us to notice. And he changes the times and the seasons. Number two, he removes kings and raises up kings. And number three, he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. The entire book of Daniel is centered in these three statements that I just read from Daniel chapter 20, chapter 2, and verse 20, and verse 21. The word change in Daniel is common. For example, we find in Daniel chapter 4 that Nebuchadnezzar was planning for many years of prosperity. He went out on the balcony of the palace. He said, isn't this the great Babylon that I built by my power and more glory and for the glory of my kingdom? That's what he said. He was planning for years of prosperity. By the way, this was at the end of his reign. And God said, I'm going to change your plans. And so he became insane for seven years. He lost it. And yet God preserved his kingdom for seven years, in spite of the fact that there were probably rivals out there. And God restored him to the throne. God changed his plans, and God showed him that he placed him on the throne. He removed him from the throne, and he restored him to the throne. We find also in Daniel chapter 3 how God changed the plans, the wicked plans of Babylonian rulers. You know, Nebuchadnezzar raised up an image, and we're going to talk more about this a little bit later. And he commanded everyone to worship the image. He thought that he was in control of the situation. The Bible tells us that there were three young men who refused to worship the image. And so Nebuchadnezzar said, let's throw them into the fiery furnace, heat it, heat it to its maximum heat. But God changed the king's plan. Jesus came into the furnace and delivered the three young Hebrew worthies. We find the same theme in Daniel chapter 6. You know, the king gave a decree that could not be changed, but when Daniel was cast into the lion's den, God changed the plans of the king. So God changes the times and the seasons that are established by human beings in, contra in contradict to, di contradiction to what God has established. God places kings and he removes kings and he gives wisdom to the wise. Now let's take a look at Daniel chapter, let's go to the introduction of Daniel rather. Daniel and Revelation are full of symbols. A metallic man, savage beasts, domestic sanctuary animals, speaking horns, strange actions such as eating a book that is sweet in the mouth and then bitter in the stomach, unusual numbers, etc. The book of Daniel has exotic terminology, symbolic terminology that must be deciphered or must be decoded. In contrast to the symbolic sections of Daniel, we have simple down-to-earth stories in the first half of the book, primarily. These stories are easy to understand and seem to need, need no decoding or no deciphering. Children have been inspired by the story of the three young men that were cast into the fiery furnace. 
they've been inspired by the story of Daniel being cast into the lion's den. No doubt these stories were written to inspire us to be faithful to God all throughout the course of human history. The stories are down to earth, easy to understand, apparently no symbols in these stories. However, these stories in Daniel 1, Daniel 3, Daniel 4, and Daniel 5 have a deeper dimension than what appears in the surface. They are not mere stories that transpired once upon a time. These stories illustrate in narrative form the symbolic language of the book. In other words, the stories are actually an easy to understand illustration of the sections of the book that have symbols, the apocalyptic sections of the book. Stated another way, the stories decode the symbols and help us understand in simple, matter-of-fact language the meaning of the symbols in the ap apocalyptic sections of the book. In short, the stories are literal and local types of worldwide and spiritual events at the end of time. They are a small-scale illustration of much greater invention, events on a global scale at the end of time. As we understand the reasons for the conflict in the historical sections of the book, we can comprehend the nature of the conflict at the end of time in the apocalyptic sections of the book. So let's consider, first of all, the story of Daniel 1, and then we're going to take a look at two other chapters, Daniel 3 and Daniel 6 in the narrative stories of Daniel, and then at the end we're going to go to one of the apocalyptic prophecies, Daniel chapter 11, the last few verses, and Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Daniel 1 describes the arrival of Daniel and his friends to the kingdom of Babylon. Let's read about it in Daniel chapter 1, and verses 1 and 2. Daniel 1, 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Now these verses present a contrast, a contrast between two cities, Jerusalem and Babylon, a contrast between two kings, Jehoiakim and Nebuchadnezzar, a contrast between two gods, Yahweh versus the Babylonian god Marduk, between two temples, God's temple and Marduk's temple, and between two peoples, the Hebrews and the Babylonians. So Daniel and his friends, as well as other nobles, arrived in Babylon to a strange land with a strange language a strange culture, a strange religion, and yet they purposed in this very difficult environment that they would be faithful to God. All the nobility were taken to Babylon, and yet it's notable that in the stories of Daniel, chapter 3 and chapter 6, there are only four of those nobles that the text tells us were faithful when crunch time came. These young men did not simply want to fit in, they did not want to accommodate, they did not want to be popular, 
They did not want to be politically correct. They simply made up their minds when they arrived in Babylon that they were going to be faithful to God. And you know, it's very interesting that as the stories develop, these young men lived up to their decision, the decision of their will that they were going to be faithful to God, God no matter what. We know that Daniel was 18 years old. Ellen White tells us he was 18 years old when they were taken to Babylon. He was a young man. And in spite of all of the pressures of Babylon, he and his friends, which were probably of similar age, made up their mind that they would be faithful to God. And chapter 1 reveals that they were faithful to God in four specific ways. First, Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm going to change the worldview of these young men, which will change their behavior or their conduct. The king believed that by teaching them the culture of Babylon, the philosophy of Babylon, the language of Babylon, and the religion of Babylon, he would be able to change their way of thinking, which would also change their way of behaving. He hoped that the curriculum in the University of Babylon would shift their world view. However, the Hebrew worthies never used the Babylonian methods that they learned in the University of Babylon. They never used the crystal ball. They never went out at night to look at the stars. They never tried to read the palm of the hand. They never tried to contact the dead like the pagans did. Whenever they wanted wisdom, they pled to God for wisdom. All the way through the story. When you get to the end of the book of Daniel, when the kingdom of Persia rises, Daniel is 88 years old at the end of the story of Daniel chapter 6. And yet Daniel, at 88, was just as faithful as he was when he was 18. So the king says, I'm going to change their worldview by educating them in the University of Babylon, the secular university, and that's going to make them servants of Marduk in a Babylon. The second way in which the king tried to change these young men was by constantly reminding them that his God was more powerful than their God. He constantly rubbed it in their face. After all, he said to the three, three young men and to Daniel, if your God is so powerful, if he's more powerful than my gods, why are you my captives? And so constantly Nebuchadnezzar rubbed it in as well as the wise men of Babylon saying, if your God was more powerful than the gods of Babylon, you would not be in captivity to Babylon right now. So the gods of Babylon have brought you into captivity. The third way in which the king attempted to change the worldview and the conduct of these young men was by changing their menu. He said, I'm going to give them the rich food of Babylon, which included unclean meats, and I am going to give them the fermented wine of Babylon, and that is going to change their perspective of diet. They did not buy in. We know the story in Daniel chapter 1. They said, we are vegan, and so we request that we be given vegetables and water to drink. By the way, Ellen White repeatedly mentions that what we eat determines our ability to distinguish between right and wrong, between good and evil. The purpose of having a vegetarian diet is not so that we don't die of a heart attack or so we don't die of a stroke. That's included as well. But our diet determines our ability to grasp spiritual things. And so Nebuchadnezzar says, I'll give them the wine of Babylon, I'll give them the food from my table, and the young men said, no way. We are faithful to the Lord. 
And we all know the story. After 10 days of trial, they were more healthy than all the other wise men of Babylon. The fourth way in which Nebuchadnezzar attempted to change the worldview of these young men was by changing their names. From names that exalted the God of heaven to names that exalted the gods of Babylon. The king felt that if they heard their na Babylonian names enough times that they would perhaps buy into the Babylonian religion. But you know what's interesting in the book of Daniel? Whenever Daniel referred to himself, he never used his Babylonian name. Neither did the three young men. And when God referred to Daniel and his friends, God always used their Hebrew names. They did not buy in to the change of name. And we know that names represent what? Character. The king wanted to change their character. So when they arrived in Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar says, we are going to reprogram these young men. We are going to teach them the religion and the customs of Babylon. We are going to rub it in that their God is less powerful than our gods. We are going to insist that they partake of the Babylonian menu. And we are going to give them Babylonian names so that as they hear the names, perhaps that will influence their character. But God's loyal servants were persons whose lives were guided by principle, not by circumstances. Daniel and his friends, the chapter 1 tells us, purposed in their hearts, that is, made a decision of their will that they would not defile themselves. The convictions of these young men were exhibited in their conduct. Daniel and his friends were faithful in this small test, and that prepared them to face victoriously the large tests when their lives were at risk. And you say, this was a small test? What if they looked weaker than all of the other wise men? Well, then the cook would have had a problem. Perhaps not Daniel and his three friends. Ellen White wrote in the book Councils on Health, page 66, the following words. What if Daniel and his companions had made a compromise with those heathen officers and had yielded to the pressure of the occasion by eating and drinking as was customary with the Babylonians? Now listen carefully. That single instance, if they'd done that just that one time, that single instance of departure from principle would have weakened their sense of right and their abhorrence of wrong. That single one. Indulgence of appetite would have involved the sacrifice, notice, of physical vigor, clearness of intellect, and spiritual power. One wrong step would probably have, have led to others until their connection with heaven being severed, they would have been swept away by temptation. He who is faith, faithful in little will be faithful in much. And he who is unfaithful in little will be unfaithful in much, the words of Jesus. And Jeremiah express, expressed it this way, if you ran with those who are on foot and you got tired, how are you going to run with the horses? In other words, if you don't pass the small tests, what makes us think that we're going to pass larger tests? Today we are going to focus on Daniel 3 and Daniel 6, and also at the end on Daniel 11 verse 40 through chapter 12 and verse 1. A careful study of these chapters give us the characteristics of Daniel and his friends as far as their character or life was. You know, in the book of Daniel, there is not even one mention of Daniel sinning against the Lord. 
Now, I know that in Daniel 9, he included himself in the prayer. He says, we have sinned. Undoubtedly, Daniel, at some point during his life, sinned, because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But it's notable that in the book of Daniel, this man of God, there's not one sin that Daniel personally committed. He was faithful in his secular life, and he was faithful in his religious life, as well as the three young men. Therefore, Daniel and his friends foreshadow the last generation that will live upon this earth. The last generation will not be changed by ba vain philosophies of the world. They will not be intimidated when the wicked say, and by the way, this is what they're going to say, where is your God? We have the upper hand. They will not drink the wine of Babylon and eat the food of Babylon, spiritually speaking. And they will not receive the name of the beast on their foreheads. In other words, spiritually, they will be faithful like Daniel and his three friends. So let's look at Daniel chapter 3, which prefigures symbolically the global story of Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 through 18. Actually, Daniel 3 helps us to see in a simple story the issues that are going to take place in Revelation 13, 11 through 18. Now, before we go directly to Daniel chapter 3, I want to mention that the experience of Daniel 3 and the experience of Daniel chapter 6 illustrates two of the clauses of the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to uh, read the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. And you say, what does that have to do with Daniel 3 and with Daniel 6? Well, we're going to see that it has very close relationship. By the way, the beast of Revelation 13, 11 to 18, the beast that rises from the earth, what power does it represent? Come on, you can tell me. That beast that rises from the earth is what nation? The United States of America. So the United States of America is going to fulfill what happened in Daniel 3. But in Daniel 3, it's a local story that takes place of, with literal Israel, at the end, it's going to be spiritual Israel, and it's going to be global. Now let's read the First Amendment, and I'm going to make some comments as we move along. Congress shall, you know, it, the word will could have been used, right? Congress will not. But there's a difference between will and shall. Will mean that, you know, you're going to do it. Shall implies what? obligation. You shall not kill. Okay? It involves obligation. And so it says Congress, which actually enacts the laws, shall make how many laws? No law respecting an establishment of religion. Notice it doesn't say establishment of a church. Right? It says establishment of religion, period. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. These are the first two clauses to the First Amendment of the Constitution. Congress can make no law that establishes religious observances nor forbids religious observances. Is that point clear? Shall not. In other words, it's forbidden for Congress to do that. Now the third clause to the First Amendment guarantees full civil rights. The First Amendment continues saying, or abridging, notice it doesn't say eliminating. What does abridging mean? It means to diminish or contract or to reduce. This amendment doesn't, doesn't say uh, that Congress 
can abridge or, or can eliminate freedom of speech. It says it cannot even what? It cannot even abridge, which means to diminish or to contract or re to reduce freedom of speech. So it says, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble, not to burn down cities and to invade the capital. Okay? To peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. That means that the government can in impact judgment when somebody is uh, harmed by somebody else. So the third clause of the First Amendment says that Congress can't make it a law that abridges speech, that uh, eliminates the freedom of the press, the right of the people to assemble peaceably, and to petition the government for justice. That is the First Amendment to the Constitution. The First Amendment guarantees full civil and religious liberty. It guarantees these rights to all citizens. These are not accommodations, allowances, or privileges that the government grants the citizens. They are rights given by God, not by government. Congress can make no law that establishes religion. They can make no law that forbids the free exercise of religion. In the United States, people have the right to worship one God, many gods, or no God without interference from the government. Civil rights, such as freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of peaceful assembly, and freedom to request redress of grievances belong to all citizens, religious, non-religious, and anti-religious. Now why do I bring the First Amendment to the Constitution to view? Because Daniel 3, which was local and dealt with literal Israel, is going to be repeated on a global scale in the United States of America in Revelation 13 and verses 11 to 18. There's a connection between the stories. In other words, the narrative of Daniel 3 illustrates in matter-of-fact language, simple language, easy to understand, what the symbols of Revelation 13 represent. So Daniel chapter 3 simplifies what the final controversy is going to be about. Now let's notice the parallels between Daniel 3 and the end time. In both, there is a conflict between the religion of Babylon and the religion of God's faithful remnant, right? In both, there is reference to a beast who sets up an image. By the way, did Nebuchadnezzar behave as a beast for a while? For seven years, he behaved as a beast. And did he raise up an image? Yes, he did. You see, we start catching a glimpse that there is a relationship here with Revelation chapter 13. In both, every nation, tongue, and people are commanded to worship the image. You can see that in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 4. In both, there is a death decree against those who refuse to obey the command of the civil ruler to worship the image. In both, there is a small remnant whose lives are governed by principle and would rather die than worship the image of the beast. In both, there's a shaking out of the unfaithful in this testing time. Clearly, there were other Hebrews present there as well. In both, the reason for the controversy is worship and obedience to God's commandments versus false worship and obedience to the commandments of men. In both, it is the religious leaders that try to convince the political leader to enact this law, this religious law. In both, the wrath of the king and at the end time of the civil powers. 
is raised because their authority will be questioned. In Revelation chapter 12, 17, it says the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. What happened when the three young men refused to worship the image? Let me read uh, from the book um, of Ellen White. Actually, it's uh, Signs of the Times, May 6, 1897. What the king did when he said, what God is going to deliver you from my hand? Ellen White wrote, with hand stretched upward in defiance. And then she expressed or explained what the face of Nebuchadnezzar looked like. She wrote, satanic attributes made his countenance appear as the countenance of a demon. He was so enraged, as will the civil powers at the end who will be influenced by the religious leaders of the nation to implement a religious law written by the co Congress of the United States of America. Daniel 3 illustrates what happens when religious leaders influence the civil rulers to establish religious observances. To establish, let me ask you, did Nebuchadnezzar establish religion? Yes, he did. He raised up the image and he commanded everyone that had, they had to worship the image. The chapter also illustrates what will happen when the religious leaders will influence the civil power of the United States to repudiate the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment to the Constitution. Let me ask you, would a Sunday law be a violation of the First Amendment? Duh. Is it established in religion that everyone has to keep Sunday as a day of rest? That's an establishment of a religious observance. It would be unconstitutional. And yet Revelation 13, 11 says that this beast that has two horns like a lamb, which represents civil and religious liberty, will speak like a what? Will speak like a dragon. Another parallel is that the three young men went through a severe time of trouble. They were thrown into the furnace. Their faith was severely tested. The furnace was heated seven times hotter than ever before. Maximum heat. However, the young men, with courage, before the king, refused to worship the image to the beast. They preferred to die than sin. They passed through the fire, but were not consumed. The same thing is going to happen spiritually with God's people at the end of time. Are God's people going to go through a severe time of trouble? Yes. Do you know that Ellen White compares that time of trouble with what happened to the three young men in the fiery furnace? Notice Great Controversy, page 621. Great Controversy 621. Speaking about those who, who go through the final time of trouble, their affliction is great. The flames of the furnace, this is not a literal furnace, we're dealing now with the fulfillment of Daniel 3. The flames of the furnace seem about to consume them, but the refiner will bring them forth as gold tried in the fire. God's love for his children during the period of their severest trial is as strong and tender as in the days of their sunniest prosperity, but it is needful for them to be placed in the furnace of fire. Their earthliness must be consumed that the image of Christ may be perfectly reflected. In this story in Daniel 3, Jesus is the hero. At the critical moment, Jesus stood up to deliver his faithful servants. Now it's interesting to notice that Nebuchadnezzar said that the fourth person in the furnace looked like what? The Son of God. That's verse 25. But in verse 28, the king says that God sent his angel, not the angels, God sent his angel to deliver them. So the question is, who delivered them? Was it the Son of God or was it his angel, the God's angel?
the Father's angel. Hmm. Keep that in your mind. The Son of God is the angel of the Lord. The key word in Daniel 3 is deliver. It's used five times in Daniel chapter 3. We find it in Daniel 3.15 where Nebuchadnezzar says, What God shall be, deliver, be able to deliver you from the furnace? The young men answer in verse 17, Our God will be able to deliver us. And he definitely will deliver us. But if not, we still serve the true God. And then it's used also in verse 27 where Nebuchadnezzar praises the God of heaven because he is able to deliver. Remember that word, deliver. It's a very, very important word that we will see again in Daniel 6 and we will see it again in Daniel chapter 12. Jesus is the hero of the story. You know, sometimes we say that uh, we need to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I agree. But if it hadn't been for Jesus, they would have been cremated, right? So Jesus is the deliverer. In the midst of the time of trouble, Jesus will stand up. The angel will stand up to deliver his people. The stories of Daniel 3 and 6 reveal the real issues in the final conflict. The struggle will not be over the oil of the Middle East, an ethnic war between Muslims and Jews, or a conflict between East and West, or a controversy between Ukraine and Russia, the issues in the final conflict will be deeply spiritual, unconditional worship to God, and loving obedience to His commandments. That will be the issues at the end of time. Now, before we go to Daniel 6, let's notice a very important prophetic principle. Literal Israel was literally captive in literal Babylon. The literal king behaved like a literal beast, raised up a literal image in a literal valley, commanded, commanding everyone to literally bow and worship the literal image. A remnant of literal Jews refused to literally bow before the literal image, and therefore they were thrown into a literal fiery furnace and were delivered from the literal flames by Christ who literally came into the fiery furnace. All of that is going to take place again, but not with literal Israel, with spiritual Israel. Not with literal Babylon, Babylon but with spiritual Babylon. Not locally, but globally. So Daniel 3 will have another fulfillment, and if you want to see the prophetic fulfillment, as I mentioned before, it is in Revelation 13, verses 11 through 18. We need to keep that in mind. What is the final conflict about? We know that it's over the Sabbath, right? The final conflict has to do with the Sabbath. Now, why do we keep the Sabbath? We keep the Sabbath in honor of whom? The Creator, right? The Sabbath concludes creation and God establishes it as a memorial of creation. So let me ask you, would it be wrong to observe Sunday in honor of creation? Yes, because that's not the day that God established to memorialize creation. Notice how Ellen White connects the Sunday law with what happened in Daniel 3. This is from Manuscript Releases, volume 14, page 91. An idle Sabbath, a what? An idle Sabbath has been set up. As the golden image was set up in the plains of Dura, and as Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, issued a decree that all who would not bow and worship this image should be killed, so a proclamation will be made that all who will not reverence the Sunday institution will be punished with imprisonment and death. Do you see how Daniel 3 and Revelation 13 are related according to the spirit of prophecy? Now let's go to Daniel 6. The story of Daniel 6 is also going to be repeated on a global scale during the final crisis. The story illustrates the crisis that will come when the United States government will violate 
the free exercise clause of the First Amendment. You see, there's a difference between the decree of Nebuchadnezzar and the decree of Darius. You say, what's the difference? Nebuchadnezzar established a religious observance. He said everybody has to worship the image, but Darius established a law that Daniel could not practice freely his religion by praying. The decree by Darius forbade the free exercise of religion. There you have the first two clauses of the First Amendment, and you see what the result is when the religious leaders influence the civil power to legislate in religious matters. Daniel chapter 6 thus illustrates what happens when the free exercise clause of the Constitution is violated. Now let's make the parallel with Daniel chapter 6 and the end time. The Bible tells us that Daniel was full of the Holy Spirit. Are God's people going to be full of the Holy Spirit through the latter reign? Yes. He had a profound relationship with God and he revealed it in his life of prayer. His relationship with God was more important to him than life itself. He would rather die than sin. Daniel also had the gift of prophecy, and he had a passion to understand the prophecy of the 2300 days, particularly Daniel 8 through 12. Is that true of the final remnant church? Absolutely. Daniel was faithful in the secular affairs, his everyday affairs. His enemies could not find fault in his service to the king. He was obedient not only to the first table of the law, but also to the second table of the law. Daniel 6 verse 4 says, So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. We need to be exemplary citizens. We need to pay all of our taxes. Hello. Because if we're unfaithful, then God is not going to be able to say, you know, there's no fault in them. Daniel 6, 5 tells us that his enemies found fault with his religious convictions and practices. We find in that verse, then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So once again, what is involved in Daniel 6 is God's law, and also worship. Both of those words are central to Daniel chapter 6. Once again, in Daniel 6 we have the civil power giving a religious decree in violation of the free exercise clause of the Constitution of the United States. Of course at that time uh, Medo-Persia was a pagan kingdom, but the principle applies. Was there a faithful remnant in Daniel chapter 6 who had a profound covenant relationship with the Lord and refused to obey the religious law imposed by the civil power? Once again, you have a remnant. By the way, the religious law was written and signed by the king with a death decree against those who dared to disobey this civil law. Daniel faced death for disobeying the religious law imposed by the state. The civil power was not inimical to Daniel. The idea for this law did not come from the king, but rather from the king's counselors. Did God allow Daniel to go through the tribulation? Why did he allow Daniel to go through the tribulation? Why did he allow the three young men to go through the fiery furnace? Because when they came out, God was greatly glorified, he was revealed as the truly great God. Is that true of the end time generation as well? Will God's people bring honor and glory to God by their obedience? Absolutely. The word deliver is used five times in Daniel chapter 6. It is a critically important word. And there's something else that is very interesting. In Daniel 6 verse 22, if you go with me there, Daniel chapter 6 and verse 22, we find a very interesting little detail. It says there, 
Here, Daniel is talking to the king. My God sent his, what? He sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth. Do you know that the angel was God? Notice this statement from Ellen White, youth instructor, October 1855. Morning, noon, and at night, Daniel prayed to his God. Notwithstanding the king's degree, decree and the fearful den of lions, he was not ashamed or afraid to pray. But with his windows opened, he prayed three times a day. Did God forget his faithful servant when he was cast into the lion's den? Oh, no. He was with him there all night. He closed the mouths of the hungry lions, and they could not hurt the praying man of God. The Son of God, the angel. And you say, well, is Jesus an angel? Just hold on. Now, it's interesting. Why did God deliver Daniel? Well, the Bible tells us why he delivered Daniel. Because he served God continually. That's what the king said. Has the God whom you continually serve been able to deliver you? Daniel says, oh yes, the God I continually serve has delivered me. And by the way, at the end of this story it says that Daniel trusted in his God. In the Greek translation of the New Testament, that word trusted is translated faith in Hebrews chapter 11. It says in Hebrews 11, all the heroes of faith and heroines as well, it says that those heroes obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, and quenched the violence of fire through faith, through trust in God, through continual trust in God. Now let's go to Daniel chapter 11. And I'm just going to synthesize. We're going to study this more in detail this afternoon. Daniel 11 verse 40 describes a power that is known as the king of the north. The king of the north represents the end time persecutor of God's people. It represents the Roman Catholic papacy, which will persecute God's people with the aid of the civil power of the United States of America. And if you read these verses from verse 40 through verse 45, we're told that this king, who is called the little horn, it's called the abomination of desolation, the man of sin, the harlot, many different names, the Antichrist, all of these passages refer to the same power. It tells us that this power is going to go out with the intention of slaying God's people, blotting them off the face of the earth, just like Daniel and his three friends. Ellen White wrote in Great Controversy, page 618, Satan numbers the world as his subjects. But the little company, notice the remnant idea, the little company who keep the commandments of God are resisting his supremacy. If he could blot them from the earth, his triumph would be complete. That will be the goal at the end. Daniel 3 and chapter 6 revealed that the conflict will be over religious convictions of God's people. The issues will be worship and obedience to God's commandments or to the commandments of men. The same issues that existed in the days of Daniel will exist at the end of time. Yet, in the midst of Daniel's time of trouble, in the midst of the final time of trouble, someone will stand up to deliver his people. Who is that? Go with me to Daniel chapter 12. Now we're going to find the identity of the angel. He's not a common angel. He is the archangel. That is God's angel. His angel. By the way, this is a name that is given to Jesus. Do you know what the name Michael means? It means like, who is like God? Do you know what the world is going to be saying according to Revelation 13 verse 3? Who is like the beast? And who will make war with him? And so Michael is going to stand up. He says, I will. Daniel 12, verse 1. Notice the word deliver. At that time, Michael shall stand up. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. 
But now notice, God's people are not delivered from the time of trouble, just like Daniel was not delivered from the lion's den and the three young men from the furnace. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. Now comes the good news. And at that time your people shall be what? Ah, the same key word, will be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. Now I had something else I was going to say, time is coming to an end, but let me just share this. The final conflict we know has to do with obeying God's commandments, primarily the fourth commandment. It's going to be a similar test that Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden. You say, really? What was, the, what was the controversy in the Garden of Eden? It was between the Word of God and the Word of the serpent. Now, if Adam and Eve had obeyed the commandment of God not to eat from the tree, they would have been respecting God's authority, correct? They listened to the, to the Word of the serpent and they disrespected God's authority. The tree had the purpose of testing whose authority they would obey. Behind the tree was which authority they were going to obey. The final controversy is going to be the same. But instead of God using a tree, he's going to use a day. And some, at some time ago I was talking to someone uh, who's not on the seventh day and he said, you actually think that God is going to test the world over a day? I said, well, what's the problem? He tested Adam and Eve with a tree. <laughs> right? God has different tests for different periods. In other words, by obeying God's commandment to observe the Sabbath, we are respecting the authority of God. By keeping the first day of the week, we are respecting the authority of the power that claims to have changed the day to Sunday. Behind the day is the issue of whose authority you will obey. And Daniel and his friends are a great example. They said, we will obey the Lord no matter what, even if it means dying for the Lord. Isn't that what God expects of his people today? You know, you have people saying that we're going to be sinning until Jesus comes. You know, Jesus will take care of it. The end time generation is going to have the character of Daniel and his three friends. Faithfulness unto death. And we begin the process by being faithful in the small things now. Because if we're not faithful in the small things now, we will never be faithful when the great tests come in the future. So my call, folks, is that we choose to be faithful to God in every detail, not to earn merit, but because we love the Lord and we want to respect His authority. Let's pray, Father in heaven. Thank you so much for these stories. They make it so simple. Sometimes the symbolic sections of Daniel and Revelation, they're a challenge to us. But the stories... They're easy to understand. We know what's going to happen. And you've given us real life persons, Daniel and his friends, to tell us what's going to happen at the end. Thank you for this comfort. Thank you, Lord, for these promises, the glorious promises of your protection, even in the times of the deepest persecution. I ask, Lord, that you will touch each heart here this morning. Lord, that you will lead everyone to make a decision like Daniel and his friends, a decision of the will, to purpose that we will be faithful to the Lord in every detail of our lives, that we will not allow culture, the culture of the world, to influence our decisions in life. I ask that through the power of your Spirit, you will do it, because we ask it in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. I'll bet you you can't guess what song we're going to sing. <laughs> when I was pastor of the church for 20 years, we always ended the service with this song. We have this hope. So let's stand, and I want to hear you sing, okay?
like you did when I pastored the church? Let it ring. I think it's 214 in the hymnal, isn't it? Okay, so please stand and bellow it out. you ought to join the choir. That was beautiful. Father, be with us now as we leave this place. May your Holy Spirit never leave us. We ask that you will bless the food that we're going to partake of, that you will keep us faithful until Jesus comes. We pray in his name. Amen. You may be, dis you may be seated and the deacons will dismiss you. Have a happy Sabbath. Thank you.